And uh, now we are perfectly on time uh, to move on to our next speaker, Barış Çakmak from Bahçeşehir University. Um, he's a young, brilliant scientist and uh, made, uh, received uh, several uh, important awards, including Mustafa Parlar Award from uh, METU. And uh, Barış is working on, in general, open quantum systems. And recently, he shifted his interest from quantum optics to a little bit more fundamental questions in quantum thermodynamics. And he's also an expert in general on quantum control theory. And we look forward to listen his uh, lecture today. So Barış Hocam, whenever you like, you can start your lecture. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, can I have one more request? Can you, uh, so there's also another participant named Barış Çakmak tablet. Uh, can someone also make that a co-host uh, so that I can share my screen? Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, this has been taken care of. Okay, it should be fine now. So, uh, okay, I guess you can see the page at this point. Um, uh, everything is fine, right? If possible, it might be better to make it landscape, right? Landscape, okay, Ojan. Um, yeah, this is much better. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, so thank you for uh, the kind introduction in general. Um, so today I will be uh, talking about uh, thermodynamics of quantum control. Uh, but uh, mostly I will be talking about controlling uh, closed quantum systems. Um, so there are uh, actually three words in our title. So we have uh, so we have so we have quantum. Uh, we have thermodynamics. And we have control. Um, so uh, there are uh, so all of these. Uh, so you can group these three words in, uh, in by in uh, groups of two. Uh, all of them make sense basically. Um, so we have. Uh, so I'm in general, um, as Özgür just stated, I'm in general working in a field that's uh, called quantum thermodynamics uh, nowadays which basically deals with uh, the definition of heat, work, entropy, entropy production, uh, irreversible entropy production in, in non-equilibrium quantum processes. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, I mean uh, the following, for example, uh, I deal with problems involving driven quantum systems. So quantum systems that, have an ex the, that we have an external control over uh, such that we can drive their Hamiltonians at a finite time or in, an, uh, in, a, in a designated time interval. Um, so it's interesting to see uh, what happens in this case, the amount of irreversibility uh, that, we, uh, that we create due to the finiteness of the, uh, of the process, uh, or uh, we can also uh, uh, investigate um, uh, quantum properties such as coherence uh, correlations on the uh, on the thermodynamics uh, on the properties uh, on the thermodynamic properties of these systems. Um, so we have um, so these two so quantum thermodynamics by itself is uh, is a is an emerging field basically. Uh, maybe thermodynamics of control uh, is something that we are and um, that uh, maybe uh, we are in general not uh, familiar of. But uh, uh, actually, uh, when we talk about thermodynamics uh, or when we talk about thermodynamical processes, uh, what we usually want from such processes, what we usually demand from uh, some thermodynamic processes, is uh, we, in general, would like to um, identify processes uh, that waste the minimal amount of resources. Therefore, uh, we, in general, I mean, uh, when, we, uh, when we analyze thermodynamical processes, we, in general, want to control them in a way such that uh, we, uh, we waste the minimal amount of resources. So, uh, I mean, this is by itself 
uh, something meaningful, so thermodynamic control in that sense. Uh, I mean, you can also historically trace this back uh, even to the beginning of the thermodynamics, which is basically due to Carnot, Saadi Carnot, uh, and I mean, the, the, the science of uh, thermodynamics uh, actually emerged uh, but, uh, through, uh, uh, through the analysis of uh, making better and better engines uh, in the beginning of the industrial revolution. So, I mean, it's so the wasting minimal amount of resources basically is it is at the uh, core of the thermodynamics. Now, finally, uh, the quantum control part is something that's actually uh, I mean relatively new, uh, I would say, um, uh, because I mean in general, um, so th there were uh, a couple of I mean people already mentioned this a couple of times uh, yesterday. Um, so we are uh, so uh, so it's a it's a classical word to say that okay we are in the beginning of this uh, of the second quantum revolution, uh, uh, which is basically uh, attributed to a paper in the beginning of two thousands uh, written to proceedings of national uh, no proceedings of the Royal Society I guess I will put up uh, all the references in a drive file at the end of tomorrow's lecture so uh, I will also put that paper in so this uh, this one the second quantum revolution basically refers uh, to the following so in, the first one was uh, these computers um, these electronic revolution let's say uh, so in this first revolution we were um, so uh, we were basically in a passive role so uh, we used the tools of quantum theory to understand the uh, the properties of uh, uh of materials uh such that i mean we built um uh devices out of them so we understood that uh, the the energy levels are, are discrete we have um and we have these kind of things so we uh took advantage of these things uh so the second quantum revolution basically refers to a phase in which uh humans uh, are expected to have an have a more active role such that uh, they actively manipulate quantum systems to basically um, do tasks um, and perform tasks such as information processing. Uh, I mean, quantum computing also enters into this uh, information processing title. And also, uh, we would like to build like devices, thermodynamic devices, quantum con counterpart of the thermodynamic devices. Uh, so in this case, we basically need quantum control. We need to control quantum systems uh, as they as they evolve from one state to the other. Okay. Um, so this is in general the main motivation. I mean, I uh, uh, I didn't need to give the title in thermodynamics of quantum control. Uh, I may as well. I might as well given the title as quantum control and thermodynamics or uh, any other uh, combination. Um, so basically, uh, let's uh, try to start from somewhere. So we basically, uh, in a general uh, a central task in, in, in physics, and also maybe in engineering also, uh, is uh, we in general want to control, we want to take an initial state and in the end, uh, if we are going to perform a task such as an information processing task, a quantum comp a computational task, or a thermodynamic task, uh, whatever the task that we want to do, we take a physical state and we basically want to manipulate it uh, according to our aim. Um, so this is this kind of uh, uh, this is a central task. So we want to transform states from an initial state to a desired final state, okay? This is a very general problem in, in that sense. So, uh, so a central task in physics, like uh, we can say state transformations. Okay. So we would like to start from an initial state, uh, uh, let's say, I mean, counting on the, uh, 
lecture of uh, Jayun Hoca yesterday, I uh, I am lucky that I uh, I can freely use these state vectors, Hamiltonians, and uh, expectation values. Um, so uh, we start from an in initial state, let's say psi initial, okay, and then I want to evolve this uh, to a final state uh, psi final, okay. And then uh, I would like to, uh, in general, uh, while doing this, uh, I change a parameter in the Hamiltonian of this system. And the Hamiltonian of the system is basically uh, an operator that's controlling the total energy uh, of the system. So I, in general, I have a time dependent Hamiltonian uh, in which I have a parameter that I can control such that this state is trans uh, transformed from an initial to a final state. Uh, obviously, during this time evolution, uh, the uh, I mean, this time evolution itself is in general uh, described by uh, the Schrodinger equation, the time dependent Schrodinger equation, which we can write as uh, I H bar uh, the time derivative of uh, psi uh, H psi. Oops. Okay, um, so that's fine, uh, but uh, the problem uh, it stems uh, and, and the, we come across a problem when we want to uh, basically do this state transformation at a finite time, okay, because uh, I mean, again, let's refer to a, a, a thermodynamical uh, concept. So any finite time process uh, irreversibly produces entropy, okay? Uh, and this irreversibility is, uh, uh, is quite problematic because we, in general, uh, would, as I said, we would like to waste minimal amount of resources so when there's an irreversibility, it means that we, uh, so it's literally, I mean, as the name suggests, it's irreversible. So we waste some amount of uh, our resources into that irreversibility. So we, uh, we lose resources. So, um, um, so maybe let me write this. Um, so uh, any finite time process, uh, irreversibly produces entropy. Okay, and this entropy is something that we cannot trace back to uh, a, a heat exchange. Okay, so it's like an intrinsic entropy production uh, due to the finiteness of the pro uh, of the of the process. We will, uh, I mean, in detail refer to this in a, in a moment. Okay, um, so therefore we usually, uh, so in order to waste minimal amount of resources again, uh, we usually uh, perform such transformations in quantum systems uh, adiabatically. Okay, uh, what do we mean by adiabatic? Uh, we, we mean the following. We uh, perform these transformations. Usually, we perform these transformations uh, very small. Özgürcan, you want to interrupt? Yes, maybe you can clarify if you exclude unitary processes, no? Uh, unitary processes in what sense? Because the unitary process wouldn't produce any entropy. Uh, yes, it would conserve the von Neumann entropy, but in general, uh, when you perform a unitary process at a finite time, you would generate coherences, right? So uh, it would uh, create entropy production, even though not entropy. So in, in, in that sense. Um, so in... in, in in general, uh, so uh, we usually would like to uh, evolve a system uh, uh, infinitely small, uh, infinitely small, slow in that sense. So we uh, we would like to resort to adiabatic dynamics uh, 
Um, so uh, in general, uh, adiabatic processes for quantum systems. Now, uh, for quantum systems, adiabatic processes, as I said, are, uh, are infinitely small. Uh, in fact, the adiabatic theorem itself, uh, quoting from the, uh, from the original paper, uh, sorry, uh, itself, which introduces the, uh, the uh, adiabatic theorem for uh, quantum systems, uh, it states the following. And so a physical system remains in its instantaneous eigenstate if a given perturbation is acting on it slowly enough and if there is a gap between uh, the eigenvalue and the rest of the Hamiltonian spectrum. So we, what we mean by this is that uh, if we change the uh, control parameter in the Hamiltonian of our system slowly enough, and if there is an energy gap uh, so assume that you are in an in an uh, in an eigenstate of an Hamiltonian, and you are changing the Hamiltonian. If the energy state that you are in have a well separated energy level from the rest of the spectrum, and you change the parameter in your Hamiltonian slowly enough, uh, then you remain in this uh, energy eigenstate, so that you can control. I mean, you can change the state of your system under control without causing any irreversibility in that sense, okay? Um, however, as I said, these processes are, uh, are infinitely slow, uh, depending on your uh, energy, depending on your separation from the rest of the energy spectrum and depending on how fast you are uh, doing this. Uh, so, I mean, in order to be in the adiabatic limit, you need to perform this uh, process in a in a very uh, slow manner. Okay, so uh, these are slow processes. Okay, um, however, uh, we do not have that much time uh, with quantum systems, especially. Uh, because the quantum systems uh, are inherently fragile. We, we, what do we mean by this? I mean the following. So any quantum property uh, uh, would be lost with an inevitable interaction uh, with the environment. Okay, so any uh, quantum superposition, any, um, any cor quantum correlation between uh, if you have uh, a multipartite system, any quantum correlation would then also be uh, decaying uh, as the time goes by. Uh, therefore, you would prefer fast transformations. Okay, so uh, so quantum systems are uh, inherently fragile. Uh, therefore, uh, fast manipulation is required. Okay, now uh, this is where the quantum control part comes in. Okay, uh, so uh, people thought about uh, some ways to overcome this uh, the slowness of these adiabatic dynamics, which provides us uh, a high degree of control. Okay, uh, even though they are slow. So uh, the name for these techniques uh, are uh, uh, is called shortcuts to adiabaticity uh, and many of the quantum control protocols can be considered within this within this umbrella of shortcuts to adiabaticity so uh, shortcuts to
or the abaticity. Um, so this would be uh, the main uh, uh, title that uh, uh, we refer to when we talk about uh, quantum control techniques. So there are a couple of different uh, techniques, as I said, that uh, that goes under this name. And what they do is uh, you can imagine uh, they are doing something like this. Uh, so they take a slow process uh, and they basically put some wheels on it so that uh, this turtle can move fast, okay? Um, so we take these adiabatic dynamics, we desire and we, we, want, uh, our, we want to be in control of our quantum system while we change some of its uh, properties. Uh, it's better to do this adiabatically, but it's too slow. So what we want to do is basically, uh, we would like to um, find a shortcut uh, to these adiabatic dynamics, okay? Now, there are a couple of ways that you can do it. Uh, one way to do it is basically to, uh, to remain as, as you move from an initial state to, uh, uh, to a final state, you remain on the adiabatic limit at all times. So some of these shortcut techniques does this. Uh, and some, uh, some of these shortcut techniques uh, that probably I will not have the time to talk about, uh, they basically, what they do is that they do something different uh, as, you, as you move in between the initial state and the final state, but they guarantee you that you end up at the adiabatic final state, okay? But in the meantime, between initial and final states, uh, you do, and your state leaves the adiabatic limit and does um, uh, uh, goes to other states, but the, the control method basically guarantees you that at the end of the process, you, are, you will be in the, uh, in the adiabatic final state. So how does these shortcuts to adiabaticity uh, uh, methods work? They usually work in a way, uh, in, in, in the following way, basically. Uh, so uh, you have your Hamiltonian, H of T, uh, you have a parameter that you can change in this time-dependent Hamiltonian, okay? So an STA method basically does the following. So if you uh, change your Hamiltonian slowly enough, uh, you will remain in the adiabatic limit and everything would be fine. But if you would like to fasten this uh, process, what you do is you basically uh, take your Hamiltonian and add an external control Hamiltonian to this. So let's say HSTA, okay, depending on the uh, uh, depending on the type of the shortcut method that you would like to apply, the form of this uh, HSTA changes it, actually, okay? So today I will be talking about one uh, STA method, which is basically quite central in these, uh, 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 and quite central and quite popular within this shortcut methods which is basically uh, the counter diabetic driving, or uh, it's also known as transitions quantum driving, okay? Um, so uh, in order to do that, I will uh, try to, uh, okay, I will basically go through a very uh, simple derivation uh, in which we are only going to use uh, the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian and also the Schrodinger equation. I will not even solve the Schrodinger equation. I will just write the um, uh, differential equation for the Schrodinger equation, okay? Uh, so that we can see what a finite time trans, uh, what a finite time driving can do to our uh, system and how can we get rid of that uh, effect uh, by adding an extra control term, okay? Um, so uh, let's maybe, uh, okay, let me maybe put the title counter diabetic driving here. Okay, 
so I will uh, at the very end we will reach to this uh, uh, expression for the counter diabetic driving. But for now, let's say that we have a time dependent Hamiltonian. Okay. So uh, we have a time dependent Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, H of T. Okay. And then it has a set of eigenstates, instantaneous eigenstates. And by instantaneous eigenstates, I mean the following. This Hamiltonian is changing as the time goes by. It's a time-dependent Hamiltonian, clearly. Uh, and these eigenstates also uh, follow these changes, because since the Hamiltonian is changing, the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian is also changing. Okay? So let's say that they, I label them with n. Uh, so these are also time dependent and they are the instantaneous eigenstates. So they satisfy this equation uh, E n n of t at all times. Okay. So uh, the the set of these eigenstates n of t uh, they are um, denote the instantaneous eigenstates okay uh, fine and let's say that we have the following initial state which basically uh, is composed of uh, which is a superposition of these instantaneous eigenstates okay so we have the following initial state okay uh, let's say psi uh, or not an initial step okay uh, mm, let, okay let's say that we have mm, let's not call it the initial state but let's say that we have a state uh, that is basically in a superposition of uh, these uh, and instantaneous energy eigenstates okay uh, and now we know that this state, which is in a superposition of all the energy instantaneous energy eigenstates, it evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. Okay, which basically tells you that IH bar, uh, the, the time derivative of uh, psi of t is equal to h t uh, psi of t. Oops, okay. Um, so we can basically just plug this in, okay, and see what happens um, here. Um, so I'm going to drop the uh, time uh, dependence here, but please keep in mind that the, all of these things are time dependent. I'm just dropping them to have a more compact notation. Okay. Uh, so when I plug this in here, uh, I have I need to take the time derivative of the uh, right hand side. So I have a time dependent coefficients and I have a time dependent, I have a set of time dependent eigenstates. Okay. So I need to take the time derivative of both of these guys. Okay. So I have an IH bar. Fine. I'm keeping it. Uh, and I take the time derivative of uh, this Cn. So I have the summation over n. So I have the time derivative of Cn and I have the uh, eigenstates. Okay. Plus I have Cn and the time derivative of the eigenstates because they also depend on time. Okay. Um, Fine, and on the right-hand side, I have the following. So I have the Hamiltonian that's acting on my uh, on my state psi. So my state is Cn times n of t, okay? And remember these n of t are the eigen, uh, eig instantaneous eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So when the Hamiltonian uh, basically hits uh, to these n's, uh, it will spit out an En, basically, okay? So I am going to have, uh, again, uh, sum over n, uh, Cn, En, uh, 
n. Okay. Fine. Uh, then let me do the following. Uh, so they uh, so since these instantaneous energy eigenstates for, uh, form up an orthogonal basis, uh, so they are all orthogonal, orthonormal to each other. In fact, um, so let me approach this equation uh, with a bra m uh, from the right hand side. Okay. Now this would give me uh, the following. So uh, so this m, uh, so the first term that it would come across is this n. Uh, so m and n they are uh, always orthogonal, orthonormal to each other. They only give one since they are orthonormal uh, when m is equal to n. Okay. So uh, as the first term, I have i h bar uh, c m dot and m and m n and m will give me a delta function which is basically one and uh, as the next term i'm going to have an ih bar uh, here okay i have a sum over n okay i still have cn here so i have n dot here and i'm coming with an m so i don't know the result of this so i'm going to keep it as it is at this point Okay, and on the right hand side, I will also, uh, so if I hit with m bra m from here, I will also hit this uh, with the same uh, bra m. Uh, so it would again give me, uh, so this out of this summation, it would pick when n is equal, to, it would pick the term when n is equal to m. So this is, this would give me c m e m. Okay. And that's the only thing. Uh, so let me maybe, if you like, I can rearrange these things uh, by simply taking this guy to the right hand side. Maybe it would be uh, much better. Okay. Um, okay. And then I am going to make this a minus sign. Okay, so I have the time derivative on the right hand side, and I have uh, time derivative of the uh, coefficients on the left hand side, and the rest on the uh, right hand side. So uh, from the sum, from the sum, let me separate that uh, separate the term when n is equal to m. Okay, uh, so from the sum. Uh, separate the term uh, n equals m, okay? Now, what would I have if, when n is equal to m? I am going to have minus ih bar cm, m, m dot, okay? And let me group this cm with this uh, n equal to m term here, okay? So I have an ih bar uh, cm dot, uh, which is equal to like em, from the n equals m term, I have a minus i h bar, uh, what, mm, m, m dot, okay, in the parentheses. So, and then I have the cm parentheses here, okay. And the last term is i h bar, the sum when n is not equal to m, because I separated that term, and then I have cn, uh, m and dot. Okay. Now uh, this is basically uh, uh, the expression that I would like to uh, reach. Okay. So let's try to analyze this, uh, or try to let's try to make sense of this. So uh, let me remind you what the adiabatic theorem stated. Okay. Uh, a physical system remains in its instantaneous eigenstate. Okay, if a perturbation is acting slowly enough, let's keep it there. We have a separated energy eigen, uh, we have a separated spectrum, so I don't need to refer to the next part at this point. Uh, so a physical system remains in its instantaneous eigenstate if a given perturbation is acting on it slowly enough. Okay, so uh, I am, so CM is the coefficient of a, uh, of an instantaneous eigenstate, okay, remember. Uh, so I 
I'm going to so cm dot is related to cm if I can get rid of this term. Okay, so if I can, if I am able to ignore this term, okay, the time derivative of cm will only be related to the uh, to the cm, okay, uh, which is basically my uh, uh, my coefficient on that energy eigenstate. So I do not have any coupling. Uh, in this, if I can ignore this term here, so this term is the problematic term at this point. Okay, so if I can ignore this term altogether, uh, I do not couple to any of the other energy eigenstates. Okay, um, so it already hints you uh, from this expression that when uh, I mean, when can you ignore this term? So if, uh, as you can see, if this n dot is small. Okay, or even if it's not changing at all. Okay, uh, if n is not changing at all, and that would be zero, so uh, we would get rid of this term here. Okay, so if the uh, if the Hamiltonian is not changing, we are fine we, if it's time independent. Or if it, this n dot is small, so that I can neglect this term, I'm again fine. Okay, so because this is the term that couples me to the rest of the energy eigenstates. Okay, and it does this in an in a non-controlled way. All right. So uh, I mean, when the last term is negligible, last term is negligible. Uh, I only have cm dot equal to this quantity times cm, okay? And then this would be a trivial uh, first order differential equation. Uh, so cm would be given by uh, an exponential uh, of uh, minus i h bar integral from zero to t prime, let's say uh, em minus. Um, ih bar, sorry, m, m dot uh, dt prime, okay, with cm zero here. So uh, the uh, value of our uh, coefficient of the uh, energy eigenstate would only depend on the initial value of that uh, uh, energy eigenstate, okay? Uh, so this is basically the adiabatic evolution. Okay. Uh, again, I'm repeating when we can ignore this last term, which means that when n dot is small or zero. Okay. Um, so uh, let's. Um, so I will tell you uh, in a moment. Uh, how can we get rid of this term? But maybe it would be uh, uh, instructive to see what this term is, m and dot. Okay. Um, so try to understand uh, m and dot. Okay. So in order to do that, uh, let's uh, let's. Remember that uh, this eigenvalue equation, these n's are the instantaneous eigenstates uh, of the Hamiltonian H. Okay. Now let me take the time derivative of of this equation here. Okay. Let's say this is star. Uh, differentiate star with respect to time okay now what would i get uh, in this case my hamiltonian is time dependent so the derivative of the hamiltonian times the eigenstate plus the hamiltonian itself times the derivative of n which would then be equal to e n dot n plus e n uh, n dot okay again let me come with an or so normal uh, bra from the right hand side. Okay. So uh, from this first term, I would get 
m h dot n okay uh, from the second term so this Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator as you all know uh, it can also it can it can operate to the left and also to the right so when I come with m from the left h can operate on this m and give you a e m okay and this is m this is n dot right uh, and on the right hand side so uh, e n dot is just a number so m and n they are orthonormal so uh, they would only give uh, one if n is equal to m okay which is not the case so this term drops down and then the as a final term i would get e n m and dot okay uh, now let me rearrange this so this term, uh, so I was uh, curious what this term stands for, M and that inner product, remember, okay? So let me leave that alone. Uh, so I have an EM, M and dot, EN, M and dot. Uh, so let me leave M and dot alone. I would get the following thing, okay? So M H dot, n this is a matrix matrix element of the time derivative of the hamiltonian divided by e n minus e m okay now this tells us uh, quite a lot actually um so the term that's causing the problem here not the whole thing uh, i will come to the whole thing in a moment but just this single thing uh, m and that inner product uh, it's basically dependent on the time derivative of the Hamiltonian, uh, which basically is a measure of how fast you are changing the Hamiltonian, okay? And also it's inversely proportional to the energy level separation, okay? So the energy uh, difference between two different energy eigenstates, okay? Now, if you are varying your Hamiltonian very slowly, which means that this h dot is very small, then this term is small, which means that we can neglect this last term here and we are in the adiabatic limit, okay? Uh, and also uh, pay attention to the fact that it, this term is inversely proportional to the energy level separation. So when the separation is high, when the energy level separation is very large, this term is again, very small, okay, which basically also uh, uh, relates to the second part of the adiabatic uh, theorem, if there's a gap between the energy eigenvalues. So when you don't have any gap, or if the gap is too small, you would again be easily out of the adiabatic evolution or the adiabatic limit, okay? Uh, fine, now uh, let's write the whole term okay uh now so uh let me uh conclude somehow by saying uh a couple of things okay um so uh so clearly when h dot is small uh we are in the adiabatic limit, okay? Or, okay, I can add a term to my original Hamiltonian H of T, okay? So to my Hamiltonian H of T, I can add a term uh, that after all these calculations that we went through, okay, uh, cancel this term here, okay, cancels this term here. Uh, now, it basically comes with a minus ih bar, the sum over n not equal to m, cn, uh, m, n dot, okay. Now, what I can do is that, or uh, I can add the positive version of that uh, term, or uh, add, uh, add the following term to your 
original Hamiltonian, okay? Which is, uh, let's call this as the HCD counter diabetic or H transition striving, which is IH bar, the sum over uh, N not equals to M, uh, this term here, M H dot N divided by E N minus E M. Okay, uh, so that this HCD, when you add HCD to your original Hamiltonian H here, uh, you would get rid of this last term here, and you would be in the adiabatic limit, no matter how fast you change your Hamiltonian, okay? This is uh, called the counter-diabetic driving. So this is a, a quite general result, okay? Uh, so when you, I mean, you can do, do this for any Hamiltonian you like, okay? And this allows you, this counter-diabetic driving allows you to uh, perform any uh, finite time, I mean, allows you to remain in the adiabatic limit for any finite time process, uh, no matter how fast you do the driving, okay? However, the problem with this term uh, is the following, which I will probably be talking about tomorrow, uh, is the following. So the first thing that's uh, the first problem, which I won't be talking about tomorrow probably is this. So when you have a, uh, when you have small systems, for example, when you have a two level system, a qubit, or when you are talking about a harmonic oscillator, problems uh, that can be easily solved, uh, this finding this HCD is quite easy, okay? However, when you have a many body system, uh, as you can see, we have M and N here. So these are the instantaneous energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Don't forget that, okay? So you need to know these things and you also need to know the energy, uh, energies of these uh, instantaneous energy eigenstates as you are changing the Hamiltonian, okay? So uh, to calculate CD, you need to know these eigenstates and eigenvalues at all times, okay? So for a qubit, this is doable, uh, but for a many body system, for a, like, for example, for 50 qubits, 50 spin one half particles, this is an intractable problem. Uh, so applying this counter diabetic driving approach to many body systems is a bit problematic. There are ways to overcome this. Uh, maybe I can very briefly touch them tomorrow. And the other thing, other problem is uh, that so this is an additional Hamiltonian term, okay? This is an additional Hamiltonian term that I need to introduce uh, externally, okay? So I, will, I need to do uh, this thing that I did at the top. So I would, if I would like to do an STA to this Hamiltonian H of T, this H of T, I am going to add an HCD to this, okay? And this is an external thing. Okay, that I need to do basically. This is what we mean by controlling the quantum system. Uh, so I, as a uh, as a person or a person in the lab, I need to somehow apply this counter diabetic driving. Uh, so this is going to have an energetic cost. Okay, uh, that's also a bit problematic in some applications of these counter diabetic driving because I mean, you need to decide if it's worth uh, energetically, if it's worth to uh, do this counter diabetic driving or uh, in fact, do everything slowly such that you remain in the adiabatic manifold uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the dynamics. So uh, this is where the thermodynamics of quantum control comes in. So the, the energetic cost of this term is, uh, is also quite important and finding ways to reduce this cost uh, is, also, is also important. Uh, maybe I can stop here uh, and then uh, continue with, uh, with a very small application and the cost discussion uh, and well, how this cost comes in, how it comes in 
uh, in different applications of these counter diabetic driving and why it is important in, in different applications. Thank you, Barish. I'm sure this step-by-step uh, -step derivations were very clear and helpful to the students and everybody. Uh, we can take some questions, but maybe let me do the opening. So at the beginning, uh, Barish, you said that you want to design some control method to get some initial state to a target final state, right? Mm. So this is the basic problem. And uh, now we have just uh, designed this AHT to do this, but we realized that this is fast and we want to increase the speed and add this HCD. And uh, how do we know that we can still get the same target state? Will, will we end up somewhere else? Um, I mean, uh, the thing is, uh... So if you know that, uh, so this this depends on the Hamiltonian, obviously. So you basically, I mean, I was planning to do an application, but maybe it would be more clear when we do an application, for example, a lambda and an avoided crossing type of application. Um, so uh, in general, you, you uh, imagine an idealized process uh, in which you know that when you change a parameter in the Hamiltonian from an initial value to a final value so let's say that uh, uh, during this trans so let's say that during this transformation uh, i have a parameter lambda okay uh, in the hamiltonian that's time dependent okay and uh, throughout this transformation i change this lambda from in its initial state to its final state lambda final okay uh, now in this idealized process, if I if I imagine this idealized process and then I say that, okay, if I do this adiabatically, if I vary this slowly enough, I would end up in this final state that I, that I desire. Uh, once you can say this, once you fix these parameters and all, uh, depending on your, uh, depending on what your desired, desired final state is, then you can count on the counter diabetic term uh, uh, to take to make sure that you end up at that final state. So you think in an idealized world that okay, if I do this adiabatically, I would end up in this state. Once you fix this, once you uh, con conceive this idea, then the counter diabetic driving term basically does the job for you, uh, as if the dynamics is adiabatic, but it, uh, with the help of this HCD, we do it at a finite time. Uh, but the faster you do it, uh, the higher the cost, the energetic cost of this counter diabetic term, but that would be the, um, uh, the topic of tomorrow problem. Okay, thank you. So the, basically the target state is always uh, somewhat similar to the initial state, like in the adiabatic transformation. You only want this uh, CMs get a finite phase, a global phase that is ignorable. Yes. As long as you can do it either by adding HCD or dropping this extra term in equations, then you're fine. Yes, I mean, uh, you can only, I mean, at a finite time transformation, you can only, you cannot drop this term. Because I mean, this term is basically proportional to, as we showed here, this term is proportional to the time derivative of the Hamiltonian. So but, but, but the target state is already the CM up to some phase factor. Yes, exactly. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. and you need to somehow get rid of this this term that couples you to the rest of the uh, to the rest of the energy eigenstates in an uncontrollable way. This. Okay. Thank you. And the, another question is that uh, this e, this gap that you are talking about, it is also changing in time. So I have to make sure that at all times it is uh, it's not yeah. very yes, serious. Exactly. And actually, that's also another uh, quantum control method. So the thing is, uh, so even if you have a level crossing, uh, if when even uh, when the gap closes and then uh, one of the energy eigenstates changes, I mean. Uh, uh, the energy of one of the eigenstates becomes larger than the other, or there's an energy level crossing. If you are doing things slowly enough, uh, you always follow the same uh, energy eigenstate. So, uh, for example, you, we have these uh, adiabatic passages. 
uh, such that you can uh, invert populations and all. So if you would like to do that also, I mean, if you would like to invert the populations, if you, uh, that's also fine. You can also do it in an, with an adiabatic method and you can even fasten that with this counter-diabetic driving term. Uh, however, as I said, it depends on what you would like to control uh, in general. Um, that would be my answer, I guess. Um, Okay, I understand. Um, do we have questions from the audience? In the chat, I don't see any, but if you have further questions, you can email Barish. Yeah, um, anyone can email me, maybe let me write it. Uh, I'm sorry, of course there is no. And maybe your lecture notes are accessible also. Uh, yes, I will put them in Drive uh, after I complete the lecture notes of tomorrow also, together with some references to papers, basically. And no homework for today? Uh, <laughs> I guess I took a bit longer than I was expecting, so therefore I, um, let's skip the homework for today. I will give uh, a couple of homeworks tomorrow. Uh, okay, then uh, thank you, Barish, again.